Hello folks and welcome to the UK car news for February 2024 and this one we're mainly looking at auto car and auto express and that's where we're starting this one off. Please give the video a thumbs up and I'll crack straight on. Uh, London Udes claims misleading says the UK advertising watchdog. The Advertising Standards Authority has responded to high numbers of complaints about London for transport claims regarding ULEZ. Basically, they've said that sitting inside your car in London is the most polluted place you could possibly be. And the Advertising Standards Agency have said, well, you've only used anecdotal evidence for that. We're not having it. Good day to you. I would argue that standing on the platform in a tube station is a thousand times worse uh, than being sat in your car in terms of the air quality. But again, I couldn't put that in an advert because it's anecdotal evidence only. So tut tut London for transport, get your facts straight before you start printing stuff. Uh, car makers are killing the spare wheel, but motorists really want them. More than 80% of drivers want a spare wheel in the boot, but it's an increasingly rare luxury. This is a couple of reasons why manufacturers are doing this. A, it saves them a bit of money to put some jollop in the boot rather than a wheel and a tyre. But B, it also gives you more boot room. And that's something people often forget. You've now got those like underfloor spaces that you didn't previously have, um, or certainly not as deep as they are now. Uh, what is a bit lazy is when you see a car that's still got the spare wheel space and you don't get a spare wheel in it. Um, but let me know in the comments, what do you think? Do you want spare wheels still? Or are you happy with a tin of jollop and a bit more boot room? It's not all EV at Volvo. XC90, XC60 and S90 and other hybrids in line for updates. Now, Volvo have pretty much done away with diesel now, but for their plug-in hybrids, they are still going to keep sort of updating and improving the models they've got. It looks like that's going to start in the second half of this decade, so... Probably nothing this year or next year, but then we will start to see some updates to all their cars, actually. V60, S60, V90, S90, XC60, XC90. It looks like it will only be the plug-in hybrid models, um, but Bjorn Anwell, the chief operating officer at Volvo, said clearly the transition to electrification happens at different timescales around the world. And at strength of Volvo is we have this balanced portfolio. So it goes on to say that basically Volvo got the XC90 and the EX90, uh, the XC90 being the internal combustion engine, the EX90 being the full EV. And they don't expect those two cars to really sort of stand on each other's toes when it comes to sales. Um, they think they're going to sell way more EX90s in Northern Europe than they will XC90s. But other places like Eastern Europe, Central United States, the eastern side of the United States, they're expecting more XC90s. Uh, the west coast of the US, I think the AX90 will be the one because they're far more into electrification at the moment. It's an interesting article here from Chris Rosamond, well worth a read. Can Saharan solar power drive the hydrogen car revolution? We take the Skoda Enyaq EV to the Sahara via the world's biggest concentrating solar power station for a glimpse of the potential future of green hydrogen production. So there's this huge solar power station that's really set up just to produce hydrogen. The article goes into quite a lot of detail about sort of how it works and why and everything else. And they're saying that really and truly, whilst you could power cars using hydrogen in future, and indeed it may be a, an option for some, um, they've got to Sahara in, in a battery car and uh, it wasn't that difficult. And as we know, if you power cars with hydrogen, it's way less efficient than actually just powering them with a battery because you're essentially making electricity to make hydrogen. You put hydrogen in the car as the fuel cell and it has to convert back to electricity to power the car. So it's way, way less efficient and therefore probably be a more expensive way of doing things. Well, it will be. There's no probably about it um, at this moment anyway. But hydrogen looks like the way forward for commercial transport, things like shipping and rail. So I just wanted to touch on that piece so you can go and give it a read because I can't do it justice in this sort of quick format, really. One million electric vehicles sold in the UK. Milestone passed amid concern over private buyer uptake. Fleet sales continue to drive EV transition as private buyers hang on to their petrol and diesel cars. So this is from the SMMT and they're saying here with the right government policies, we could have a million more in just two years. Um, what those policies are remain to be seen. But there's a good idea for a start. Look, putting a solar panel on top of a charge point. Hmm, who'd have thought? Now they talk here about the EV market growing by 8% in January 2024. 
um, up almost 11,000 units compared to January last year. But the rise in new registrations being driven by fleet and company buyers and private buyers not being so quick on the uptake. Now, there's another side to this, really. Let's look at something like that Corsa that, you know, that was going out the door for 30 grand plus that you could buy it two years old for 12 grand. Why would you buy a new one at the moment? And it goes back to the thing I always say, if you want a new one, lease it. If you want to buy one, buy it used. And it's as simple as that. I've said it since day one. Although electric cars have been around for a while now, it's still early days in terms of the technology and it's progressing at an absolute rate of knots. Once things progress, your car devalues. Obviously, we've got all these company cars sitting in the market, coming back to the market as used vehicles. It means you've got massive oversupply and that just means prices get driven down. So if you want an electric car and you want to buy one, buy it used. That's my best advice for you. And certainly if you want a new one, just lease it. Symbols. Now, this thing looks like it could be a little bit of a game changer, but there's just one thing going against it. The price. This is a car called the Tiny Silence S04. It's got two seats, does 92 miles on a charge. But the real killer of a sales feature is the fact you can remove the battery, it comes out on wheels, take it into your house and plug it in. So you don't need to have a charger um, or you don't need a private drive, anything like that. You literally take it into your house and plug it in, uh, meaning that absolutely anyone, you can live in a flat, you can live you know, in a terrace house with street parking, you can still have an EV if you want one. Now, obviously, this is a city car. It's not made for families. It's got two seats in it, and it does have its limitations. Um, I think they can give a big tip of the hat to the smart car for its design. I actually really like it. I think it looks cool, but I've always quite liked smart cars because I'm strange. However, it's 16 grand. This is obviously supposed to be a bit more of a grown-up rival to the Citroen Ami. Um, the Ami is available for, I don't know, seven, eight grand, something like that. It only does 28 miles an hour. This one does 52 miles an hour, which again makes it far more usable for a lot of people. And the Ami's got a much lower range. I think, I think it's under 50 miles, where this one's got 92 miles. And again, it's like a, technically a quadricycle rather than a car, much like the Citroen Ami is. But for me, it's just too much money. 16 grand for this is too much money. It needs to be 10 or below. Um, to have any real chance, I feel. And I guess for Tiny Silence, they're a small brand. It's a fairly new brand. I guess without economies of scale, it makes life a bit difficult. Um, but I'd be delighted to take a spin in one of these things because I think it looks cool and I think it's a great concept, the fact that you can remove the battery, um, it comes out on wheels, and you take it into your house and plug it. I mean, that solves a problem that a lot of people have. What do you think? Would you pay 16 grand for one of those? So the new Mazda MX-5 is going to be 28 grand. The price has been revealed. Uh, the range topping one's going to be 37,000. That gets you the two liter Homura RF version. Um, but 28 grand gets you the entry level 1.5 litre Roadster. That's got 131 horsepower, 8.8 .8 inch entertainment screen, USB-C connectivity, climate control, air conditioning, black cloth seat. Then there's a 30 grand option, which is called the exclusive line. Upgrade your sound system and your wheels and all that kind of stuff. And that's available with both engines. And if you go for the more powerful engine, you also get limited slip diff. Um, but yeah, the MX-5 is a great car. Still plenty of old ones knocking about on the roads. A lot of people have them as track cars because there's such a big aftermarket for it. You can sort of fairly cheaply convert one to more of a track car. Um, but yeah, I like the MX-5, always have, and I'm glad to see a new one. Okay, I'm sort of fed up with this story. New, new say electric car could have 20 grand asking price. I don't know how often now we see it could cost this much, it might cost this much. I just want to start seeing prices that are factual, don't you folks? Uh, here's one I didn't expect. The cheap new Skoda electric SUV could be built in India with new battery tech. Again, we're using could and not will. Uh, Skoda is working on a new baby SUV to sit at the bottom of the brand's all electric lineup. And they've done a bit of a rendering about how they think it might look. Again, way too many woulds and coulds and shoulds and mights in there for me to sort of go into any detail. Uh, the new MG3 Super Mini gets dual screen set up as we see inside for the first time. Now, this is going to be premiered at the Geneva Motor Show, uh, which is uh, on the 26th of Feb. I'm going to that actually um, a week today at the time you're watching this video. 
so there'll be a video coming up on my channel here's the interior it looks like a nice upgrade from current mg interiors i've got the mg4 x power on the drive this week and uh, after filming this i'm going out to film my review of that so keep your eyes open for that um, but here is the new MG3. I think it's quite a nice looking thing. Certainly a big upgrade from the previous one. Now look at this. Toyota have done a little bit of a deal with Stellantis. And they've released the new Toyota Pro Ace Verso and Pro Ace City Verso electric MPVs. And they say here they look awfully familiar. And that's because you can also buy this thing as a Vauxhall Vivaro Life, a Citroen e-Space Tourer or a Peugeot e-Traveller. A bit of a surprising one, I think, from Toyota, but they are a little bit behind the rest of the market when it comes to EV development. And I guess it's very easy to just get something off the shelf and stick a badge on it. Obviously, Toyota do that a lot with Suzuki, um, where Suzuki rebadge basically a lot of Toyota vehicles. If at the end of the day it means you've got another Toyota to choose from and it costs you less than it would have done if they'd designed it from the ground up, I just guess it can't be a bad thing. Sorry about my voice today, folks. I'm a bit hoarse. Uh, best-selling cars in Europe. The Tesla Model Y finished 2023 as the year's best-selling car. So number one was the Model Y with 251,000 sales. Number two, that's your Sandero. Three, the VW T Rock. Four, the Renault Clio. Five, Peugeot 208. Six, the Opel Corsa. Seven, the Volkswagen Golf. Eight, the Yaris Cross. Nine, the Fiat 500. And 10, the Octavia. As always, the European stats tend to feature slightly smaller cars on average, I'd say, than, than what we see in the UK. And no different this time around, apart from. You know, number one is Shamu there, the Tesla Model Y. 83% of motorists want to ditch parking apps. Complaints concern the number of apps required, the complexity of said apps, and worries about online fraud. Um, I don't mind the apps, uh, things like Ringo and Just Park. I think they're completely fine and quite convenient when they're the only ones that you need. What is annoying is when you visit a different town or something and there's like a local council-specific app that you have to have. It's just annoying. They're quite often in a place where there's no phone signal as well, which is massively useful. I think the answer is just always give people both options. Let them go to a machine and pay or use one of the apps if they want to. They also need to make the pricing consistent across both. Um, paying an extra 60p to use an app doesn't fly with me. Now, this is something else coming up at Geneva, and uh, I can't wait to see this. BYD to test appetite for huge 1100 brake horsepower Defender rival at Geneva. Quad motor Yang Wang U8 will make European debut at Geneva alongside new Denza and BYD models. Now look at this. I think we've seen this or some renderings of this in a previous news video a while ago. Um, but it's a huge thing and you've got to love that brand name. I mean, Yang Wang, I can't help but think they might need to rethink the name Yang Wang for the European and American markets for sure. This is supposed to rival Audi, Mercedes, BMWs. They're going head on for the German brands. Interestingly, there's a 49 kilowatt hour battery, but a two litre turbo petrol engine unconnected to the wheels, which functions as a range extender. So basically you've got a two litre turbo petrol generator on an electric car. I must say, that's one of the cars I'm really, really looking forward to at Geneva, so I'll try and get some decent footage of it uh, inside and out if I get the chance. Petrol Mini Cooper brings 154 brake horsepower for £22,000, the fourth generation three-door Mary slick design with proven but reworked mechanicals. That's good because the mechanicals weren't particularly amazing on the previous Mini, were they? Certainly anyone that's had to pay for a clutch replacement on a Mini will know what I'm talking about. So the 1.5 litre three-cylinder in the Cooper C gains 20 brake horsepower, goes up to 154. The two litre four-cylinder in the Cooper S goes up by 25 horsepower to 201 with a 0 62 time of 6.6 .6 seconds. And the range top in electric Cooper SE has got 0 62 of 6.7. Inside the new petrol three door features minimalist dashboard centered on the OLED infotainment display. Look at that thing. I mean, that is bonkers. Absolutely bonkers. OLED as well. So it's going to be astounding quality, I would imagine. I'll tell you what, I can't wait to have a little spin in one of those because. Um, that looks very, very interesting. I think initially I was a little bit underwhelmed by the design, but now I've seen it all together with the interior. 
Um, I really like it, to be fair. I think it's a nice sort of evolution of the Mini. And they haven't tried to go too futuristic for the sake of it and go completely bananas so that you no longer recognise it as a Mini. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. Uh, Fisker plots European production of £28,000 pair EV. Family hatchback is due with a host of unique features in 2025. High performance variant coming too. Uh, this thing looks bananas. I really like the look of this a lot. Um, I think that that will be one of the best looking cars in its segment if it looks like this when it finally comes into production. And look at that boot. How cool is that? I must admit, I'm generally a fan of technology and new, and this sort of ticks a lot of boxes for me. At that price, if it ends up being that price, of course, uh, the pair would comfortably undercut not just similar size crossovers such as E3008 and the Nissan Aria, but also popular contenders from the class below, like the E208 and the Vauxhall Corsa Electric. I mean, can you imagine um, getting yourself one of these for less than a Corsa? I mean, I use the term a lot, but game changer it could be. And Henrik Fisker explains that he sat down with the engineers and said, get rid of 25% of the parts, find a way to do it, find a way that we can do this with 25% fewer parts. And that's what they've done. And that's how they've got it this efficient so they can actually produce it um, with such an affordable price point. It remains to be seen what the finished product looks like, um, how it drives, all that kind of stuff, and indeed what the, the price is actually going to be. But all signs at the moment are pointing to something that could be quite special. Honda plans radical new entry-level cars by 2030. The O-Series to start with electric replacements for Civic and Jazz after CEO admits it needs more affordable EVs. I've got a feeling I've covered this in a previous video, but I'm going to skip on. All I will say is Honda desperately need more affordable EVs and more affordable cars generally. They produce some fantastic cars. Um, there is one recently that's not so good from what I've heard, which happens to be an EV. Um, but Honda produces some fantastic cars, but their price point is meaning that they're getting left behind a little bit, I believe. I've got the new CRV in next week for review, by the way, so looking forward to putting that through its paces. New Czech firm launches UK's first electric 4x4 for 50 grand. As you can see, not the most original of designs i think we can fairly comfortably say but it's a single motor ev with 174 horsepower you've got two wheel or four wheel drive selectable and high and low ranges and it really is there to appeal to real off-road enthusiasts a battery range about 150 miles i mean there seems to be quite a lot going for this thing apart from the fact that it's 50 grand um, I guess they'll sell in very limited numbers, but always interesting to see new vehicles and new brands come into market. Uh, the Porsche Taycan's getting a revamp, 320 kilowatt charging, 422 miles of range and 939 brake horsepower. The flagship electric saloon receives a host of upgrades to its chassis, interior range and dynamics. And the brilliant news about this is that it's going to mean that all those Taycans that are currently on the road are going to lose their value even quicker than they already are. And we know they've lost a cartload of money, a lot of them. Um, and it means if you've always dreamt of owning a Porsche and could never afford it, perhaps uh, once this bad boy comes out, you'll be able to at last. Uh, the rear wheel drive one starts at 86 grand and the range top in Turbo S tops out at 161 and a half grand. Now, in terms of performance and range, this thing's going to be hard to beat. I mean, 0 to 62 of 2.4 seconds in the Turbo S, obviously 422 miles of range. But the 320 kilowatt charging for me is the standout because I wrote a piece recently on my website, actually, about how we keep talking about the range in cars, but we should really be talking about how efficient they are. And also, we should be talking about how fast they charge. Because when you talk about your diesel car or your petrol car, you never talk about how big the fuel tank is. Because it doesn't matter, because you just go to a petrol station and fill it up in five minutes. And you talk about the MPG a bit, but we don't often talk about how efficient electric cars are. You know, how many miles per kilowatt hour we're getting. And I feel like that should be a bigger part of the conversation than it is. Because if we could have smaller batteries that charge really quickly and are really efficient, then you'd have a cheaper car that's easier to live with. And two more Chinese manufacturers coming to the UK are Ceres and Skywell, uh, both coming this year. 
Um, I won't go into detail at the moment. Uh, we'll do that when there's actually some concrete information around both of those. But these Chinese manufacturers just keep coming. Like Every month when we do one of these videos, there seems to be a new one mentioned. At the time this video is being released, I'm on my way up to Winchester. I'm going to be at the Handlebar Cafe in Winchester, just off the M3, uh, between 10 a.m. and 12.30 a.m. today, Sunday the 18th of Feb just in case you're watching this later on in the week. So if you want to come and say hello, um, uh, just literally a group of people having a coffee and a chat. I'll be there between 10 and 12.30. Um, see some of you there. And for everyone else, please subscribe to the channel. Please give the video a thumbs up. People get annoyed with me asking for it, but when I don't, I get like two thirds or three quarters fewer thumbs up. And that is a massive driver to how much YouTube promotes my videos. So please always give them a thumbs up and please leave a comment. Catch you on the next one, folks. See you soon.